How many of you have ever read the book of Revelation? Just raise your hand. If you've read through the whole book of Revelation. Okay, pretty good. Put your hands down. How many of you have read through the whole book of Revelation more than one time? Okay, good, good. How many of you have, and don't feel bad if this is you, how many of you have never read the book of the Revelation? Okay, you're in for a ride today. Um, the rest of you, the book of Revelation is a book that a lot of people, if they read it, they read it once, or maybe they just read part of it, and then they walk away from it, they put it down, and they say, oh, I'm never going to understand that, and they just put it away, or they jump online and chase down any of the thousands of rabbit holes that are out there that have launched uh, from this book. My goal today, you know, try and keep it simple, my goal today is that we'll walk away knowing the main point of this letter and with a few handles that we can use to to hold on to whenever you read it. And you should read it over and over again, like every other book of the Bible. Read it again because that's how you learn who God is. This book of the Bible is, in a lot of ways, a summary of everything we've been talking about for these last two months as we've gone through the story of Scripture. So remember what was God's purpose from the beginning? To be with us, so we could be with him. God's purpose from the beginning of creation, to create a place where he could be with us so we could be with him. That was God's purpose from the beginning. We ruined that because we decided, now oh, we're gonna organize things around ourselves. We were unfaithful to God, messing up the ability for God to be with us and us to be with him. And we saw how God dealt with that by covenanting himself to us. We saw it through the prophets, the priests, the kings, through the whole Old Testament, how it all led to Jesus and his death and his resurrection, how that led to the pour, outpouring of the Holy Spirit on us, the church, who now become God's witnesses into this world, telling them everything God has done to be with us so we can be with him. But the world is still far, far from God, isn't it? And honestly, if we were to step back and look at it, uh, it feels like it's moving further and further away from God, not closer and closer to God. And you might be tempted to wonder, what's the plan? What, what, if Jesus really triumphed, then why aren't things changing? Why, aren't, why is it so hard to follow him in this world? Why aren't things progressing toward God's kingdom with us and us with him? And that's exactly what the people who John wrote this letter to were wondering as well. Let's talk about them. John wrote this letter to seven churches that existed in what we would call Asia Minor. Today we call it Turkey. So there's a map. Anybody remember Turkey? It's near Greece, near Italy, on top of the Mediterranean, okay? He wrote a letter to seven particular churches there. And the reason so many people have gotten so confused, or one of the reasons people have gotten so confused reading this book of the Bible is because we've forgotten that it was written to a particular group of people at a particular time in human history by a particular person who was inspired by God to share this with them. There's a reason Jesus gave John this revelation. And there's a reason John felt compelled to share this revelation with those people. So what we said last week about letters in the Bible, it can't mean to us something it didn't mean to them. So if we want to understand what it means, we have to understand first what it meant for them, what God was saying to them. And then we can start to see what it means for us. So John writes to these seven churches and he calls them lampstands because they are existing in the Roman Empire at that time and they are lampstands shining for God's kingdom. That's what they're supposed to be. Beacons pointing the way to Jesus and to what God was doing. These cities that they existed in, they were separated from the capital of the Roman Empire by a good ways. And they were eager, eager to please the emperor of Rome, to make it clear that they were good and faithful Roman cities. And so the leaders of these cities would go and do whatever they could to make that clear, going overboard even. They would look more Roman than the cities closer to the capital of the Roman Empire. And, and so they would push things really hard. And it became very difficult to live in these cities without buying into what was called the emperor cult. So around this time, and, and a few decades before this time, it became 
and actually throughout human history, it was kind of a typical thing, for emperors to start to consider themselves as divine beings, gods. And that was true here in the Roman Empire. It started probably with Nero even before, this idea that we are gods. And these leaders of these cities, where these churches are located in Asia Minor, in order to support the emperor, they built temples, they built monuments, statues, they did everything they could to, yes, he's divine, and to push that and to the point where if you wanted to have a job working in those towns and keep up your income, you had to participate in what they called the emperor cult. You had to participate in worshiping the emperor. You had to go and participate in all these things. It was part of city life. And so it came to a point where if you're a Christian, you got to wonder, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to be faithful to Jesus or feed my family? Be faithful to Jesus or get to stay home and not go to prison. Be faithful to Jesus or get beaten. This is real life and death hunger and home type questions they were dealing with and faced with. Who do you put your faith and trust in? Jesus or the guys with the big muscles and the pointy sticks that are wandering your street, that have taken over the world you know of and are the empire. The government that has control not just of the power, but of the money. Who do you put your faith and trust in? That's the very real question that they're wrestling with. And John himself, he knew this because John wrote this letter from a tiny island off the coast of Turkey called Patmos, where he had been sent because the emperor decided, I don't like you, bink, you go live alone, like the ultimate time out. Go live on an island exiled from everybody else. So he knew the power of empire. He knew the power of the nations. He knew what was going on. He understood it really well. And he writes these letters. Well, it's one big letter, but at the beginning is these seven small letters to these seven churches, telling them one simple message that if we can just walk away with, this will be wonderful. Overcome. Overcome. Don't lose heart. Don't try and straddle the fence being part of the Roman Empire and part of God's kingdom. Don't compromise. Don't fall for these counterfeit gods. Don't sell yourself sexually to this world. Don't throw in with all of this stuff. Overcome. Endure. And when we endure, we will have a place with God where he will be with us and we will be with him. That's, if you could just take that away today, that's his message to them. And then what John does with the rest of this book of Revelation, most people, when you preach Revelation or read Revelation, you stop after those first few chapters where you get those seven letters because that's all easy to understand. Then it switches, and it's like you, all of a sudden, someone drugged you, and you're having some weird trip uh, because everything gets really odd from here. But what's really happening is John begins to write a God-inspired literary masterpiece explaining what's going on. And the rest of this letter contains the revelation that Jesus gave to John. It was like a ripple opened in the fabric of space and time, however you want to describe it. And John was able to see the reality behind our reality. It may look like the government has all the power and control of the money and everything else, but pull back the curtain, pull back the veil, and look who's really in control. And he sees God And what God is doing, Jesus gives John a vision of the reality beyond the reality that you and I can see. Now, let me ask you a question. If you had a vision of reality beyond our reality, things that don't really have direct counterparts in our reality, how would you then describe it to somebody else? Have you ever tried to, some of you speak more than one language. Have you ever tried to translate from one language to the other, but the language you're translating into doesn't quite have a word for the thing you're translating? Do you know what I mean? Some of you know that. How do you put into words the indescribable, things that there are no words for because we don't have anything like it? And so what John turns to is a type of writing, a style of writing that they knew very well. There were other writings like this, In the Old Testament, there are some writings like this, Daniel in particular. He turns to a style of writing called Apocalypse. Apocalypse uses 
images and numbers and, and um, symbols to show God's perspective on our reality. That's what it's doing. It's not a secret code. It's not hidden messages. John is writing this way because it's a way of understand, a writing that they would understand. It's a way of writing that would enable him to communicate things that, how, do, how else do you communicate this? How do you explain what he just saw? You have to push language to the extreme in order to explain just a little glimpse of what this is. So for example, here's a, a simple image. He says, describes heaven as having streets of gold. And I've heard people say, ooh, I can't wait to get to heaven. I'll just start chipping away at those streets. You're missing the point. The point is, he's saying, the stuff that we consider the most precious metal in the world is the stuff they walk on up there. But push that even more. What he's really saying is, how do I describe what God's going to do? There is no way to describe it. It's beyond it. So let me push our language to the extreme. Here's the thing we think is the most valuable thing we have. Imagine a kingdom where they use that to pave their roads. So he's pushing language to the extreme. That's what John's doing. And he's writing not to make it obscure, not to make it a mystery, not so you can sit there and have to pull out all your charts and say, oh, it's this and then this is that. That's not why he's writing. He's writing to make it clear. Now, for you and me, it's not so clear because we don't have writings like this that we live in. We don't have the symbols that it's like me going back in time and making Seinfeld references to them. They'd be like, what are you talking about? Right, so they would understand it. So this is what's really important for you and me to understand. When John writes this, John uses this apocalypse style of writing because he's trying to communicate truths that we don't really have words for, and so he's got to push our imaginations to the limits. That's why. And John's readers, they would have understood the symbols and the images that he's using better than we do today because John used references that they were familiar with when he wrote this book, to help them understand what's actually going on. He's not trying to make it harder. He's trying to help them understand what's going on. And so for you and me, we, we can work, and there's a lot we understand about Revelation now that after lots of work that lots of people have done, that it's been, it's been not easy to do because we've been able to go back and discover, oh, this is what he's referring to. This is what he's saying. So now what I'm going to try and do is a little bit crazy. I'm going to try and cover this apocalypse in just the next 15 hours. I've given you handles you can hold on to, right? Remember, it's a letter written to particular people who are going through a particular problem. We have to remember that or you'll get lost. So we know why he's telling them this. He's telling this to encourage them. God's really in control. We can overcome. Here's what God's doing. Here's how you're going to overcome. And he's writing it in this way, not to make it hard for us, he wrote it this way to help them understand and also to help them push their imaginations to the limits because how else do you communicate this kind of truth that's so beyond our world? Remember those things. And I'm not going to put any images on the screen because honestly, go online and you look up images about Revelation and they all just get so crazy and wild and it, I want you to let your imagination work. Can you do that? That's one of the reasons why he writes this way so that you and I can use the God-given imagination we have to picture and feel the awesomeness, feel the horror, feel what's going on. So this is what John writes. Suddenly we move into God's throne room, and he's there, and he describes it in all of its splendor. But he sees God is holding a scroll with seven seals on it. In that scroll is... God's, how the plan for how God's kingdom is going to come on earth as it is in heaven. How God is going to work to complete the work he began in creation, drive out this disorder that we've caused by our sin and bring his order so he can be with us and we can be with him. One small problem, there is nobody w worthy to come and put that plan in motion. Everyone has failed. And we've looked through that over the last few months. Adam and Eve failed Israel failed. Who's going to succeed? And then he hears someone say, don't worry, the lion from the tribe of Judah, he won. He's victorious. He overcame sin. He can open it and get things going. And then he turns to look at this lion. But guess what he sees? He sees a bloody lamb. 
Here's lion sees the bloody lamb. And this is one of the most important points of the book of Revelation. God's new creation, his triumph was won by Jesus dying for his enemies. Jesus' death was the victory over the evil of this world. Jesus won by dying for his enemies. The conquering one is the lamb who was slain. You've got to keep that image in your head. And then this lamb, now worthy, Jesus, he begins to open the scroll and put God's project in motion. Now John's going to paint a picture over the next, the middle of this book. He's going to paint a picture of this revelation Jesus gave him about how God was going to bring his judgment on this world and set things right. And he's going to do it in three stages. Have you ever seen one of those artists who they, they paint something and first they lay down like the beginning of the painting, then they add some on top, then they add some on top. And then by the time you get to the end, you're seeing the full picture. That's kind of what John does here. He paints the picture in three stages. He's going to use three groups of seven because seven is an important number to them. Uh, it's kind of the way sort of we view 10 as like a complete set today. Uh, they viewed seven as a number of completion. And if you put seven, seven, seven together, that was the number they used for perfection. So he gives us three sets of seven to tell how God is going to bring his judgment. Each one of these sets of seven tells the same story over and over again. These three groups of seven, they're going to tell how God's going to bring his perfect judgment and resolution to this world that is ruined by sin and disorder. Each one is telling the same story, each one adding shades. But they all tell the story of how broken the world is, how it's failed to respond to God's appeals, how God is going to confront it and ultimately bring justice. So the seventh seals are opened. The first four get opened and they bring out war and conquest and famine and death. All of those things are typical day in the life of human beings in this world. The fifth seal gets opened and we hear the prayers of martyred Christians who've been killed. And they're saying, how long, God, before you judge the earth and vindicate us and avenge us? To which God answers, rest a little while longer because there's more people yet who are going to give their lives for me as witnesses to this world. That's both encouraging and discouraging at the same time, isn't it? Hold on. Then the sixth seal gets opened, and the day of the Lord arrives, and it's all pictures from Isaiah 2 and from Joel chapter 2. And God confronts evil in this world, and all the big kings and all the big rulers and emperors and all of them, they run and they hide along with everyone who followed them in terror and fear, because no one can survive God's wrath when he pours it out. And they're wondering, who could survive this day? And then John hears someone say something about there's a group that should be protected and preserved of 144,000 who will endure. And he hears them described as 12,000 from each tribe of Israel. And it's all re to remind us from Numbers chapter 1 of the military census. And so what he's hearing is making him imagine a giant perfect army of the Lord. But then he turns and sees something different. Just like before, remember he heard about a victorious lion, turned and saw a bloody lamb. This time he hears about 144,000 perfect configured troops, turns and what does he see? He sees followers of Jesus from every tribe, tongue, and nation, a multitude too large to count. These are the army of the Lamb who follow in the footsteps of the Lamb laying down their lives in this world. And God preserves them even through death. That's what he sees when he turns. So that those are the six seals. Boom, we got the first six Almost done with the first group of seven. Seventh seal opens, and guess what happens? Nothing yet, really, because now he just starts with the next series of seven, which is, again, an indication of letting us know he's not trying to tell 21 things that are going to happen before Jesus has to return. He's telling us the story, and he's going to keep ratcheting up the tension for you and me to feel the pain that this world feels and is struggling under. 
and recognize God is not ignorant of it. God is moving through the midst of it. And so, seventh seal pops open and we get seven trumpets. The first trumpets, verse 5, they bring out images from the plague. So you get locusts and darkness and poison and blood and hail. The sixth trumpet brings back the four horsemen from the first seal with the war and the death and the conquest and famine. Because though all of that is part of human suffering, all of that should have driven us to our knees, repenting and saying, God, please rescue us. But instead, we have hardened our hearts just like Pharaoh did. That's why he uses these images to remind us of Egypt. Instead, all throughout human history, we haven't responded to the brokenness of our world by saying, God, rescue us. Instead, we keep shaking our fists at God, saying, we'll fix it ourselves and chasing after money and power to try and control, at least make my life better, regardless of what it does to anybody else. The nations continue to ignore. And the question then becomes, how is the church supposed to survive in an environment like this? Just like before, who could stand when God pours out his wrath and confronts this world? How is the church supposed to live in an environment like that? And John sees two witnesses that many have taken and tried to figure out who are these two people going to be, but he calls them lampstands. I think he calls them lampstands because he's trying to show us these two represent the churches. Remember who the lampstands are in this book, the churches. These two represent the witness of the church to the world, our prophetic witness to the powers of this world, letting them know, no, Jesus is the one truly in power not following after the powers of this world, but standing up to them. And they do, and guess what happens? The beast comes into the picture, emperor and empire, and kills them. And that's tragic. But that's not the end of the story. God raises them and brings them back to life. They overcome, and they are vindicated. How? By the word of their testimony, and by the death of Jesus, who rescues us through, uh, through death, they imitate the lamb. And when the world sees this, John sees many repent. Not all, many repent. And with that, the seventh trumpet sounds. And before we get to the final group, the seven bowls, we get a peek, just a little deeper peek at the confrontation and the nature of it. It's got two aspects. There's a spiritual cosmic aspect and an earthly aspect. And so Revelation chapter 12 begins to tell the story of a dragon chasing a pregnant woman. And he wants to devour this woman and devour her child. And, and what we should remember in this is Genesis 3.15. Remember all the way back to the beginning. When God cursed the serpent, he said there would be en enmity, that he would be an enemy of the seed of the woman. But he didn't say seed plural, he said seed singular. All pointing all the way to this moment where this dragon, the Satan, is trying to kill God's people, but in particular trying to kill the Messiah, Jesus. And all this is to just tell us, look, all the stuff you see going on on your planet, in your world, all this trouble, all this, how hard it is to follow God, how hard it is not to submit to the power and the economic control of governments and nations. What stands behind all of that is a spiritual and cosmic battle that Jesus has won. But that also doesn't take away, and or blunt even, the pain of this actual earthly confrontation wherein this dragon, he says, empowers two beasts to come out. One comes from the, the sea. In biblical times, when they use writing like this, the sea represents chaos, this thing that fights against God's order. And the second, so the first beast, it represents military conquest and power. A second beast rises up representing economic power, and it exalts the first beast, becomes his hype man, and starts making everybody worship the first beast. And all this is to just help us recognize this is what empires are like. He's talking about, in particular, in his day, the Roman Empire. These beasts, they demand allegiance from everyone, obedience from everyone, that everyone follows their system. And that allegiance here is symbolized by them taking a mark, 666, 
on their forehead or on their hand. And a lot of people have said a lot of things about this mark. And every year, multiple times a year, I see some article about, oh, they got microchip technology now, and it's going to go in your head or your hand, or it's going to be this, it's going to be that, or a tattoo. He's making a very clear reference to Deuteronomy chapter 6. And you and I need to understand this. If we're going to understand what he's talking about, about this mark of the beast on people's foreheads or hands, you've got to understand where that's coming from because that, this, this mark of the beast is a counterfeit of a different mark that God talked about. Go back to Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. says, listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your strength. These commandments I give you today, they're to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. The people of God are people who are devoted and committed to God so much that they bind to their hands and to their foreheads the memory of who God is, the laws of God, how God has revealed himself so that they are completely loving God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the original. That's the mark we should wear, that I am completely devoted and committed to God, marked by him and his ways, always thinking about them, always being reminded of them. The beasts of this world, the military and economic powers, they will try to claim the allegiance that belongs to God, the devotion that belongs to God, the obedience that belongs to God, and they'll try and force everyone to live according to their laws and their ways. And the forehead and the hand thing is just a symbol of devotion and trust and attention. And now listen to me, listen to me. You do not need to have a tattoo or a microchip or anything else on your hand or on your forehead to give your allegiance over to the beasts of this world. You can be doing that right now. In fact, John is warning them about not doing this then and there in that day. He's saying, if you're walking around devoted to this empire, committed to this empire, thinking about this empire, allegiance to this empire and this world or this government power or this cultural movement, if that's where your allegiance and your love and your attention is all going, then you are wearing its mark already. This is not just something to watch out for. Oh, maybe someday in the future. This has been happening throughout human history, continues to happen. It happened in their day. It's happened in ours. And it's something to watch for right now. It's something John wanted them to watch out for right then. And the question isn't about a physical mark. The question about, is about where's your heart? Where's your mind? Where's your devotion? Where's your attention? And the reason the number is 666 is because that number is so close to 777. 777 is this number of perfection. 666 is just one digit away in each of those columns. It looks so close to being real power, so close to being real authority, so close to being real life, but it's a counterfeit. It's a fake version of God's power. And John also chose this number, I think, because he wants them to understand clearly that in his day, he's talking about Rome. Hebrew letters have numerical values. And if you add up the numerical value of the Hebrew letters of, six, of, of the name Nero Caesar, you get 666. Now, Nero Caesar has probably been dead. There's debate about who's alive and not here, but he's been dead probably for two or maybe three decades. But there were rumors that he had never actually died or that maybe he did die, but he was going to come back from the dead. And many thought of him as divine and thought of the emperor at the time as divine. And there was this idea that Rome needs our allegiance because look how divine the emperors are. They can't die or they'll come back. And what he's saying is that's all nonsense. It's a counterfeit. It's a fake. And the crazy imagery he uses about the beast, and to paint the picture of it, he borrows that all from Daniel. But guess who Daniel was writing about when Daniel wrote about beasts? 
Daniel was writing about the emperor of Babylon at the time because Babylon was the beast at that time. And then follow them with Persia, follow them with the Greeks, follow them now here with Rome. Every empire, every government, every ruler, every leader becomes a beast when it exalts itself and its own power and its own economic structure and all of that and pretends it's the giver of life and controller of life as a false god demanding allegiance. Every empire, kingdom, king, ruler, leader who does that is a beast. And it's up for you and me to understand who are the beasts in my day? Who might be acting in these ways in our day? And it's our challenge to not wear their marks, to not devote our lives and follow after them and just buy into their systems at the cost of being devoted to Jesus, but instead be marked by Jesus. Have Jesus in our mind and following Jesus' ways. I don't need laws of the land when I'm loving everybody the way Jesus loved everybody. I will naturally do what is good for everybody and what is right. And guess what? My government might not agree with what that is. Governments around the world may not agree with what that is. What am I going to do? Follow them or follow Jesus? Who is the real power? Who's the real authority here? It's our role to stand up to the beasts in our generation, whoever they may be, even if that means we lose our lives. John ends this group of seven pict- sevens, picturing the followers of the Lamb being crushed in a wine press like grapes. Just picture grapes being crushed. Because those who follow Jesus will be crushed by this world. But he assures us that God will take the blood we shed and he will fill a bowl with it. He will take the blood we shed as we're crushed by this world and use it to fill the bowl of wrath that he will then feed to the beasts and the dragon and everyone who follows after them. And with that, we move into the seven bowls. The bowls, and I'm going to go really fast through this part, they are the climactic version of the story that we've now heard twice. They start the same as the trumpets and the plagues, um, with the plagues that remind us of Egypt again. God is working to set his people free. The sixth bowl is poured out, and we get the confrontation. God says, that's it. I'm stepping in. Let's go. Um, And let's condense here a little bit. The, The dragon and the beasts and the nations who did not turn, to God, they rise up against God to, to battle him at Armageddon. Armageddon is a place in northern Israel. It's a valley where many, many, many battles took place, so they would all recognize it as a common battlefield. But on that day, the dragon and the beasts and the nations, they gather themselves up for battle, but John doesn't describe a battle. Instead, Jesus arrives to this battle already covered in blood because he already shed his blood and died for the sins of his enemies. So Jesus steps in with the sword of justice and he judges. And he holds everyone accountable for how they've treated him. The beasts and everyone who followed them, they're condemned, the dragon's defeated. They're all eternally quarantined in what John describes as as a lake of fire, cut off and never allowed to touch God's new creation. There will be justice is what he's telling us. And with that, the picture is now fully painted, and we see that what John's been trying to tell those Christians there in those churches who are tempted to give up, tempted to think that Rome's got really all the power, tempted to go along just to get along, tempted to ride the fence, or to just quit. He's saying, no matter what it looks like, God is the one truly in control. They may have all the scary soldiers, and they may have all the pointy sticks, but God is the one with the power They may pull the purse strings, but God's the one in control. Those who are faithful and stand to the end will overcome. They will overcome. And then listen, listen to how they'll overcome. In Revelation 12, verse 10 and 11 says, Now, now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Messiah. For the accuser of our, of our brothers and sisters, who accuses them before our God day and night, he has been hurled down. They triumphed over him, how? By the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Yes, this life is full of struggle and those who want to be faithful to Jesus will have our lives squished and crushed 
for those who refuse to simply fall in line with the powerful machines of our day, life will not be easy. We overcome because Jesus already won the battle. Jesus already declared us set free and victorious and gave us life that can't be taken away. And we overcome by being a voice to what Jesus has done, even if that costs us our lives. Living our lives in response to Jesus' love and what he did so that we shine like lampstands. All of us together and every one of us individually. Shine like lampstands, even if it costs us everything. But remember, remember, that's the hard truth John's telling them. That if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to embrace that truth. Those who follow the lamb walk the way of the lamb. And that will mean being crushed in this world. That will mean laying our lives down for others the way Jesus did. But remember, all of this has been what God is doing so that he can be with us and we can be with him. So Revelation ends with this picture. Revelation 21.1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea, which to them the sea meant chaos. It was a thing to dread. All that is gone. Nothing to dread and fear. He said, I saw the holy city, God's city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's the picture. Not, oh, God, please get me out of here and take me to heaven one day. No, the picture we long for, what the Bible paints for us, is God is going to complete this project he began so long ago and bring heaven and earth together, God with us so we can be with him. That's what we're looking forward to. He will wipe, verse 4, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order, disorder, that we caused of things has passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. This is not pie-in-the-sky fantasy of, oh, get us out of here and we escape to a nice place. This is God bringing and making everything right. It's not an easy fix. It's not like some vapid soap opera where, oh, how do we fix this? Well, let's just pretend the person's been in a coma the whole season, right? Or they were just sleeping and now they wake up and forget everything that just happened. That's not what this is. This is also a place where there will be healing. Revelation 22, verse 1 through 5 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city. His servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night because night was also a scary place. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. He's not trying to tell us what the cosmological setting will look like he's trying to tell us we will be with God and God will be with us. Nothing in between. Nothing more to fear. And the hurts and the pains will find healing, real, eternal healing in God. And from 1977 to 1992, Mozambique suffered under a a civil war that killed over a million people, if you can imagine, in just about 15 years. Millions more had to run away from the country to escape or find new homes within the country. In 2005, four Mozambican artists were commissioned to create a sculpture, an art installation, and they made an art installation called the Tree of Life. 
They created it out of 600,000 weapons that had been surrendered after that war. Some people have wondered, where did all those weapons come from in a nation that didn't have the resources to build them or the money to buy them? The beasts from outside their nation, the beasts of this world that wanted money and power, they brought the weapons in and gave them to the beasts within that nation who wanted money and power to wage war and death. The artists took those weapons that were meant for evil and they turned them into something good and beautiful. And that's wonderful. It's beautiful. But it's also a reminder that that's the best we can do. That's the best you and I can do. The best we can do is make a reminder and hope that'll keep us from doing it again. But guess what? Have you read the news lately? We keep doing it again and again. In spite of all these reminders, these beautiful reminders that we can make, nothing we do seems to be able to stop the order of this world because we follow the beasts that run this world or that think they run this world. Jesus will put an end to all of that. That's why we follow him. And Jesus will heal and restore and turn what was meant for evil into good. Worship team, would you, the rest of you, come back. And that is what I want you and I to remember from this book of the Revelation and everything we've talked about these last two months. As we live with Jesus on our foreheads and on our hands, devoted and attentive to him, this world will crush us. But what it means for evil, God will turn to good. We won't overcome with money or smart planning or marketing or any human ingenuity. We will overcome by the blood of Jesus, the Lamb, and the word of our testimony, our witness to him, by following in the footsteps of the Lamb who overcame. And we will be healed, and we will be vindicated, and we will be given new life where we will be with God and God will be with us forever and ever and ever.